So yes, welcome. Um, it's tough for me to stay in one spot. I like to move around, so I'm going to try to maybe just like stay here as much as possible and yet not cover the screen. My voice is um, loud, um, so I definitely don't need the microphone. Um, but as an amazing uh, introduction, actually, it's kind of hard to follow that. I retired five years ago from the New Haven Police Department. I've been teaching in higher education ever since. Um, prior to coming to the University of New Haven, I actually was um, a full-time faculty member at Manchester Community College in their criminal justice department. And then I came back to where I got my undergraduate and graduate degree, so kind of full circle for me to come back and actually teach uh, full in the forensic science department. For those of you who, um, actually a couple of you, I don't think I, most of you I haven't had, um, I teach in the undergraduate level, crime scene investigation, and I also am, I teach on the graduate level in forensic science and also online for the MS in investigations for the criminal justice department. So I do a little bit of both. But um, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is kind of the case that um, was the epitome of my 20 years in the New Haven Police Department. Um, of those 20 years, I spent about 16 years in the detective division working as a detective in the sexual assault and bias crime unit, working as a detective in the crime scene unit, getting promoted to sergeant, going back to patrol for a little bit, then coming back up to the detective division where I kind of finished out my career. Uh, I was a sergeant in charge of the, it used to be called the Family Services Division. It's now called Special Investigations where I had supervised officers and detectives who had investigated sexual assaults, child abuse, child deaths, bias crimes, missing persons, juvenile crimes, school resource officers. And then I went to the major crime unit, which I uh, was second in command and then became in command of the major crime unit for about four years. Um, the major crime unit at that time uh, that I was there, everything fell underneath um, my command. I had about 100 sergeants and officers and detectives that worked for me and we handled everything major crime related shootings homicides burglaries robberies auto theft narcotic uh, investigations fires suspicious fires um, you name it, it it came kind of underneath our uh, preview i had been involved supervising and investigating in one aspect of another several high profile cases but none greater than the murder of Yale student Annie Lay. Um, at that time that this crime was committed, I was actually in charge of the major crime unit and both myself and sergeants that worked for me and detectives that worked for me were part of the most incredible collaboration that ever uh, had taken place, at least in my time in New Haven PD, where the FBI, the Connecticut State Police, Yale University Police and the New Haven Police Department all worked together and we had a successful resolution to a case which you're going to hear about. Um, the information, the case has been adjudicated, uh, so I'm allowed to talk about it. If it was an open case or an unsolved case, which obviously there's plenty of those throughout the country and definitely in New Haven, it's not something I would be discussing. The information contained here is public information. You can get it anywhere uh, on the World Wide Web. Um, documents are there so I'm not sharing anything that's privileged nor will I share anything that was privileged in that investigation out of respect for the victim and her family in this case. So even though the case is adjudicated you still have to respect the family of the victim uh, at all times without publicizing something too much. But this case made national worldwide news mainly because she was a Yale student. Uh, she was a brilliant aspiring graduate student at Yale University who basically had disappeared. So I'm going to walk you through the timeline of when uh, Annie was reported missing, a little bit about her background up to the point where her um, accused was actually, uh, he pled guilty, was sentenced and the case kind of was closed for all intents and purposes. So. Who was Annie? At the time that Annie disappeared and was subsequently murdered, she was a 24-year-old doctoral student at the Yale University School of Medicine in their pharmacology department. She was conducting research at that time, um, and in fact, her research was funded by the National Science Foundation. She was uh, a valedictorian of her high school. She was born in California and from California to Vietnamese parents 
and she had met her fiance while she was an undergraduate student at the University of Rochester where she uh, studied bioscience. She had applied to Yale University and obviously was accepted into their uh, doctor, uh, doctoral program and she was doing research there using mice which ended up being unfortunately the room that she was murdered in uh, while she was conducting her research. She was trying to find out how certain enzymes have a role in the human metabolic diseases and um, had been granted a multi-million dollar grant to fund her research again supported by Yale University and her college professor. She was due to get married to her college sweetheart Jonathan on September 13th, 2009. On Tuesday, September 8th, 2009, Annie left her apartment in, uh, on Lawrence Street in New Haven, which is, uh, for anybody who's familiar with State Street, it's that part um, of New Haven where it's called New Hallville, but it's actually um, the lower portion of New Hallville where a lot of restaurants are pop popular eateries. A lot of Yale students live there. It's a beautiful community in the city of New Haven. So Annie left her apartment, got on Yale Transit, and was heading over to her office, which is part of Yale uh, School of Medicine, and actually heading over to the Sterling Hall of Medicine. She went into her office, and how do we know that? We'll talk about it in a little bit, but camera footage actually showed her going to her office, saw her leaving her office. She goes uh, in there, does whatever she does in her office. She leaves Sterling Hall uh, to head to her research room that's located a couple blocks away at 10 Amistad, which is a research building. Very, it's a brick building, very nondiscreet. Uh, it's where a lot of animal research is done at Yale University. Um, individuals who work in that lab facility need key card access to get in and remember that part of it because it becomes an integral part of this investigation and so you know everything is kind of controlled there's video cameras there's cameras all over entrances and exits you need to key card to get in you need to key card to get into your lab rooms annie is seen based uh from video footage walking from the sterling uh, Hall of Medicine to 10 Amistad a little bit after 10 a.m. on the morning of September 8th. She key cards into her research room, which is on the basement level, the lower level of 10 Amistad, at 10, 11 a.m. that morning. She never key cards anywhere else after that point. And to get around anywhere in that building, once you go in, the lab door closes, you need key card access. Annie's card that she, we know she had going in no longer was used after 10, 11 that morning. After 10 p.m. on Tuesday, September 8th, Annie never comes home. Her roommate calls Yale University Police Department to report that she never came home, which is highly unlikely. She hadn't heard from her all day, which again is very un uncharacteristic of Annie. So Yale University Police Department begins a missing person case, trying where did she leave this morning? What did she have planned? Checking in with professors, her research supervisor, to see if they had met with her at any point in the day, trying to establish a timeline of a missing person. They go to Annie's office, and in her office is her wallet and her cell phone. May or may not be important, don't know. Uh, and there's no way we can ask. I mean, we're thinking that maybe when she had uh, went over to 10 Amistad that she was just kind of checking in, making sure her research was okay, which involved um, hundreds of cages of mice. Uh, that was in her research room. And she was due to leave later that week because she was due to get married. So we're thinking that she was just checking in things and then that's why she left her wallet and phone there only to come back shortly thereafter. A missing persons uh, poster was created for Annie because what started to happen is no one knew where she was. No one could reach her. her. Obviously her cell phone was in her office. And this was a poster that was actually created and distributed all over the media, all over Yale campus, all over the Yale buildings looking for her. This footage in the center is actual video footage of Annie. What she was wearing on the day that she disappeared green shirt, this is a brown skirt, she had mule shoes on, white ankle socks. This is what she was seen wearing as she was going over to 10 Amistad. These are obviously other pictures of her and then a description of her. 
Yale University put out a missing person reward for anyone who had information on her whereabouts, provided a telephone number, saying, hey, you know, help us try to find this person. Anyone who last saw her, please contact this number, because at this time it's being treated as a missing person. Yale University Police Department had contacted the Federal Bureau of Investigation to ask them to assist in this case. A uh, couple different reasons. A, Annie's from California. She's due to get married. Her fiance uh, at that time was living in Long Island and they didn't know if she had in fact been kidnapped. Uh, there was no rhyme or reason for why she just disappeared from what family members and friends and her roommates had said everything was perfect. She was very excited to get married that weekend. She um, was looking forward and, and finalizing all the plans and had been in contact with family members and friends that were coming in for her wedding. There was no signs that anything was awry. One of the early theories, well, there was actually two that were going on about this case was one, um, was she a runaway bride? At that time, when this happened, there had been a couple other high-profile cases where soon-to-be brides had kind of fled and because they didn't want to get married. So initially, the thought process is, do we have this case of, again, another runaway bride? And then the other thought process was, was she kidnapped? And anytime somebody's kidnapped and brought over the state lines, the FBI gets involved because it involves a, an interstate type of thing. And so that's why in the initial stages, Yale University and the FBI were involved. New Haven PD was requested um, a couple days later to actually assist in the missing person case because there were literally dozens and dozens of people that had to be interviewed. Everybody that worked in the lab, they wanted to interview to see if they saw her. Um, they were starting to comb over all the different camera angles that all exist from the Sterling building over to Amistad and everything in between. Um, there were people from her family that needed to be interviewed, friends that needed to be interviewed, and Yale needed more resources. So at that early stage, the New Haven Police Department did provide a sergeant and six detectives to assist in the missing person portion of this case. Doing background work, you know, following up on information that was coming in, people who may have seen her. You know, sometimes when you put out a missing person poster, there's sightings of what people think are the person. But every time somebody calls in, law enforcement has to track that lead down. So they needed the resources that were provided both from the FBI, New Haven PD, and Yale University PD. At the time, these early days, the three departments are actually interviewing people, reviewing security camera footage, trying to figure out what happened. Looking at every camera angle of 10 Amistad to see if in fact Annie left the building at any point in time whether on her own or with somebody else. Like, was there anything that was captured? Because all the entrances and exits are videotaped. So, but that footage and how slow it has to go and all the different angles requires a slow and tedious process and multiple eyes to go through. Because you're looking in some of them in black and white photos. You're not looking at color images for all of them. Um, as this is going on and it's a lot of back like leg work basically that is going on during this case a graduate student who had worked in the lab and had gone into Annie's lab room finds a box of what's called white balls basically paper towels that was on a cart and on the box according to the graduate student it appeared to have reddish brown in color stains Anybody who has uh, been involved at all in any aspect of criminal justice, forensic science, crime scene investigation, it is like, hmm, it looks like blood. So the graduate student was like, you know, this box and the blood on it is kind of odd. She alerted the authorities to that. Um, the FBI and Yale University finds additional items of evidence at this early stage that had blood -like, uh, a blood-like substance on them, actually. A lab coat, um, some other items were found on that lower level, which started now uh, having law enforcement think, do we have something else that is going on here? But you have to remember, it's also a research lab. There could be blood from animals or anything else that's there, or, or God forbid a student had injured themselves or somebody else. So you can't automatically jump to a conclusion that 
this is Annie's or that something bad has happened. You have to investigate it out. So FBI agents actually go ahead and interview an animal technician that had worked there and, and was responsible for the floor. And his name is Ray Clark or Raymond Clark. Um, Ray Clark is responsible for cleaning, um, taking care of the, of the cages. If any mice uh, die that are part of the research, he removes the mice from their cages and, and has a, a close working relationship with the research students that are down there. And he's responsible for, cl for cleaning up and making sure that whole bottom level is sterile and appropriate for research. Clark, from his interview with the FBI, says that he lost saw Annie on September 8th around 10.30 in the morning. Yeah, okay, you know, we kind of know that too. We know when she key carded into her room. We know when she key carded into the building. That kind of makes sense. So it's the 10.30 window isn't... Um, out of, the, out of the realm of possibilities that it wasn't 1010 or, or 1030, but he says he sees her around uh, 1030 and that she was wearing a brown skirt and a yellow lab coat. Well, we know she was wearing a brown skirt, but we don't know that she was wearing a yellow lab coat at that time. Because even though there's all the video outside of the building, there's no video or there wasn't any video at that time of the hallways in the lab room. So you don't, once somebody gets off an elevator, you don't know where they go. So you see nothing at that point. You don't see her going into a room. You see nothing. Only thing you have is a key card to get into the room. Ray Clark also reported that he saw Annie leave her lab between 1230 and 1245 on uh, September 8th and that she was carrying her notebook and two bags of mouse food. Well, now we know what? A couple things. We know he was the last one to probably see her, but where did she go at 12 or 1230? At this stage, we're looking through all the video footage and we don't see her leaving the building. So where was she going at 12 or 12.30 and why does she have two bags of mouse food? Couple red flags go up there. Believe it or not, the same day that Annie goes missing, a fire alarm goes off around one o'clock that day. Everybody has to evacuate the building, all six or seven floors that are there. So you see a massive, uh, amount of people coming out, students, uh, animal techs, any type of service people that are in there, faculty members, everybody's leaving the building. Agents, police officers now have to comb through all of that because we're looking at all these angels, uh, all these angles, all the people that are pouring out of the building to see if in fact Annie has seen in any of the footage. She's not. So, now we know you have a fire alarm, everybody vacates the building, but she's not seen in anything. We slow everything down, we put multiple eyes on it because after a while your eyes get tired of looking at the screen trying to find an image of her, some of which is in black and white, and she's not seen. Fire alarm is cleared, believe it or not, it has nothing to do with this case as much as we thought it did, um, but I'll come back to it. And then everybody goes back into the building. Ray Clark uh, is seen at the end of the day leaving. We see the car he goes into, again, all captured. We see people are in the car. We see everything. He goes. But what we notice is that his clothing has changed. But we don't realize this early on. This is after we start combing through hours and hours of footage that his clothing had changed. Another red flag. So now we have an animal tech who saw her at 1030, admits to wearing what we know she was wearing. She's last seen 12 or 1230 according to him, but yet she doesn't appear anywhere. And then there's a fire alarm that goes on after he says he sees her, but yet she's not seen leaving the building. So where is she? During this kind of three day time span, Yale PD, the FBI and New Haven PD are continuing to interview people, going through all the video footage, you know, combing through everything, trying to make sense of it all, looking to see if any credit cards have been used. Because, you know, is it possible? You always have to think, is it possible that I missed her? Is it possible that she was behind somebody as they were leaving the building and that's why we didn't see her? You, you, you always have to raise the possibility that you're not perfect and that you missed something. So you still have to continue interviewing people. 
Uh, they had interviewed grad students that were working there, seeing if they saw her that day. There were uh, uh, several service techs that were working on the floor de that day. Interviews of them had gone on. Literally hundreds of investigators are working on this case around the clock, both from Yale University, the FBI, and New Haven Police Department. The Connecticut State Police are called in by Yale PD, because right now Yale PD, still in the early stages, are the lead agency, because they're still treating it as a missing person. Despite everything that I've told you, it's still being treated as a missing person at this point. On Friday, Saturday of that week, New Haven Police Department Major Crime Unit, myself and my team are called in to take over the investigation, <coughs> and we now assume the lead in what we are now um, considering a suspicious incident and no longer a missing persons case. Part of that has to do with we started finding evidence that was indicative of some type of an assault that had taken place. Articles of clothing that were hidden in numerous places in the lower level of the lab that had blood-like substance on it. So in addition to the white ball box, in addition to a lab coat, there were other items that were located. So now we're saying, you know what? There's no way that this is just a missing persons case. And still there was no signs of any anywhere. On Saturday, um, September 12th, there's a, a major briefing that occurs with everybody that's involved in this case over at the FBI headquarters. FBI headquarters kind of became our staging area. And the reason for that was it was a media circus everywhere. Over on Amistad Street, where Annie's lab building was, the New Haven Police Department was a circus. You name it, anywhere and everywhere, media from all over the world were camped out, literally, tents and all, um, trying to get footage and information on this case. This case made national news. Um, people were leaking information that was inaccurate, which was hindering the investigation. It was truly a circus. So we had to set up in a, in a secure area, which was the FBI. Uh, you can't get anywhere near it. it it's, anybody who knows it, it's on State Street in New Haven. Um, it was a perfect place for us, and nobody knew that we were there. Even some of the people in-house in New Haven didn't know that's where we were staged. So we had a major briefing. Um, myself and our unit got brought up to speed as to what had been done, and then we formulated a plan on what needed to be done at this point, treating it now that something possibly not so good had happened to Annie based upon the items that were being found. The Connecticut State Police um, became our right arm. They were the agency that actually had processed that entire basement level of 10 Amistad with their teams of detectives and sergeants and did an unbelievable amount of work. We literally, in this case, worked around the clock 20, 21 hours a day for about nine days um, until Raymond Clark was arrested. We'd go home, we'd shower, we'd change, we'd come back in, getting a couple hours of sleep here and there. Um, physically, it can be done, believe it or not. Uh, I lived it. I can tell you that you can go that way because your adrenaline is there and there's just so much going on and you want to find her and where is she? And we, didn't, we truly had no idea where she was. Um, Part of the uh, concern that we had once we became the lead agency was, well, where is she? We didn't find her anywhere. We're looking for her, where is she? And don't forget, during this time, the lab is still open. The lab doesn't get shut down. Uh, it was either Thursday or Friday of that week. So Annie goes missing on Tuesday. Wednesday, it's business as normal. Thursday, it's business as normal and people are coming and going. So a lot of stuff is going on there because they're treating it as a missing person case and, and you don't know how to treat it any other way at this point. Under other circumstances, the lab would have been locked down, nobody's allowed to go in and out. You treat it like a regular crime scene. You have to secure it in order to prevent contamination and destruction of evidence. But at the time, it was a missing person case. That's what they had, they had nothing else. So, um, we're like, well, if she's not here, where can she be? Well, it's a research facility. Garbage is taken out of there all the time in big garbage cans and totes, you name it. And Annie was tiny, five feet tall, 90 pounds, a little frail um, young woman. So she could have easily have been put into any type of uh, garbage can or anything 
and, and gone with regular medical waste or other waste from the building during that time. So FBI agents, Connecticut State Police, and local law enforcement went actually to an incinerator facility in Hartford to try to find the bags and the garbage that were taken out of 10 Amistad Street looking for her body or any other type of evidence that we may find. Um, any other bloody articles of anything we're looking for at this point. Um, so because there's so many people working on this case, we were able to divvy up a lot of the responsibilities in this case. On uh, Saturday, um, which is September 12th, we're in the lower level of 10 Amistad and we start getting uh, whiffs of decomposition. Now I can tell you working in law enforcement for 20 plus years, processing hundreds of crime scenes, being involved in umpteen numbers of investigation, that's a smell that is unlike anything else. When the human body dies and, the, and, and your body goes through natural decomposition, it gives off an odor. We start to smell it. And there's nothing else in the world that smells like that. So our next thing is, well, where is she? because now we know she has to be here somewhere. But you have a research building that has multi-million dollar ventilation systems. You know, where can she be that we're getting the smell? And we kept getting it and getting it. And yet we, we couldn't find her. We had no idea where she was. Cadaver dogs are brought in um, because they're trained and their amazing sense of smell can alert you to where somebody may be, even if they're hidden. The dogs actually alert to a bathroom on the lower level of the research floor, Annie's floor. They open up a mechanical chase, which is uh, a metal type of uh, wall plate where pipes and stuff are, because uh, the dog is alerting to the wall. Well, the only way in the wall is through this mechanical chase. They open it up and they find uh, Annie in the wall, uh, obviously deceased. Um, she's removed from the wall uh, later on because we had to think about how do you take the wall apart without damaging evidence and destroying evidence. You know, you have con uh, sheetrock that you have to go through in order to um, remove her. And you're not going to pull her up through um, the wall. You have to remove the wall at the same time being cognizant of any trace evidence, any biological evidence that's on her and trying not to contaminate anything. Uh, that evening on September 13th, uh, we remove her from the wall and unfortunately that's also the day that Annie was due to get married. Um, the case was a tough one. As you see, it still brings tears to my eyes because, you know, you try and you hope that she is found and yet we do find her but not where we were hoping to find her and um, for it to be on the day that she was due to get married was, was ultra hard for us um, I don't want to say bittersweet at least we found her we knew where she was um, now we had to find who was responsible for this horrific horrific crime I'll stop here for a second before I go on. Questions so far up to this point for me? Yes? You mentioned that there is uh, a lot of agencies involved in it. How did you have a determination that who was going to take the lead? Good. So initially, because it was a missing Yale graduate student, Yale University took the lead. Um, because it was their case, it started with them, and the FBI was actually assisting. Um, I know you guys got to go. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. Um, so Yale University assisted, and it comes down to who has the legal authority to investigate the case and, and possibly prosecute if need be. If he was kidnapping, it would automatically go to the FBI at that point. So Yale was the lead up until we started finding items of evidence. And then the state's attorney's office, who oversees both Yale University and New Haven Police Department, um, had given our agency control of the case. 
Um, and because now we were treating it more of suspicious circumstances, FBI had no authority um, because it was something that was a state. It didn't involve interstate. It was something in-house, and so it came to our agency as being the lead. But that being said, I honestly have to tell you, we worked seamlessly. There were some bumps. You know, you have a lot of people, you have you know, uh, supervisors, chiefs of police, you have command staff that are involved from all these agencies. And, and truly the media put a lot of stress on us. Um, so, but it was seamless. We actually were able to do the job and do it well with no problems within the agencies. Even when we came in to take it over days later, you know, Yale University, and the FBI provided an amazing foundation for us. It made it easier for us coming in a few days later to take it over from a homicide investigation standpoint. Anybody else? Yes? What was the point of entry into the wall? So it was actually through that, um, that mechanical chase, that wall unit. It was a metal, um, a piece of metal that was secured in four locations. And because she's so tiny, she actually fit in, once you remove the metal plate, it's an opening in the wall, she actually fit in the wall. Any, yes? So without those dogs, it probably, would you have ever found her? Oh, I didn't want to think about that. Um, I think we probably would have. It, it just, because the smell would have kept getting bad. Um, and, and it would have gotten stronger and it would have been, um, where we would have kept going around literally like like being a cane on ourselves and smelling where it was coming from and trying to rule out anywhere where something could be we knew by looking at it that there were no new areas that were sheetrocked or painted over you know what I mean? like that part we knew so then it's like okay where else could she be and then looking in drop ceilings there was a lot of drop ceilings there. like could she be up there we didn't think so but we still had to look because we would think that she would have fallen through or you know you would see some type of seepage um, of the decomposition process. So I, I would like to think we would have eventually found her, just not as quick. It just would have taken us a few days longer to do it. Good. Any other questions? So far? Yes? Do you think this case was treated as a missing person's case for too long? Or would you like to have it referred to you earlier? Oh, God, that's always a million dollar question. Um, I think based upon the information they had, that it was okay for it to be treated as a missing persons case. Because you had to start with, there's all this stuff going on. She's getting married, um, you know, did she get kind of cold feet? You know, that was really like the main focus initially. And, and that kind of made sense initially until when you started doing the interview and talking to different people where they're like, there's no way. There was no indication she was so happy. She had talked to somebody, I think the night before, that morning of, about coming up for the weekend, you know, for the wedding. And, and so there were no signs of that. Um, of course, we would always like to be involved from the beginning, but there was nothing leading to the fact that we had a, a suspicious death or a suspicious incident, that it wasn't something other than, which is why, I mean, literally we were combing through the video surveillance. I say we, it, it, was, it was really the FBI um, and other law enforcement agencies that were helping us do the video because we couldn't focus only in on that. There were other things that needed to be do. We needed to talk to people. We had to talk to anybody that entered the lab that day to see, did you see her? You know, and, and at this time we're also, you know, we're finding these items of evidence. It's where does it come from? Asking people to give uh, buckle swabs, you know, so that can be used for DNA purposes, you know, conducting all of this thing. And literally hundreds of people were interviewed. So I don't think, you know, looking back, everything that was done in the beginning laid the foundation for us as we progressed. Um, you know, New Haven got involved, I think it was that Thursday where they asked for people to help treat it as a missing person. Just the major crime part of it didn't get involved with it until later. But the work was truly set by then. Um, and we didn't at least have to do all that foundation work. It's always easy to look back and say, what, what, what would you have done differently? You know, should have, could have, would have. I don't know. 
based upon the circumstances that were known to us at the time, I think it was a right call that they made. Yes? When you say coming through the, the images, that was with just your eyes, or was there a digital? No, it was with our eyes. Wow. Yeah. So were you, like, were you always, like, kind of 80% confident you had it, and maybe you missed or something? Well, that's why it went through multiple people, yeah. because you had to, you really had to, and you slowed everything down. Um, and so you had to comb through all of this footage. And it wasn't just for the day that she goes missing. It was also the days afterwards. Because maybe you missed her and, you know, did she get out somehow? That you just don't, you didn't know. So, you know, it required around the clock multiple people looking at all the, the camera angles. And we focused on certain, you know, the entrance and exits, obviously. We weren't so concerned with street and sidewalk activity, we, we focused really on the entrance and the exits. How could she have come out? Um, and, and did we see anything that would be suspicious? And, and we didn't. So, yes? Since the smell would be like so prominent, nobody in the lab ever said there's a strange smell coming. Like they never- It didn't happen that. right away. So she was killed on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until Saturday that we smelled it. She's in a wall that the only s way for the odor to come out is through whatever little separation exists between the metal plate and the wall. So there's nowhere for that to go. And so it took that long. And remember, with decomposition, a lot of things come into play. Um, temperature, you know, was it cool? It was September, honestly, I don't remember back then what the temperature was like. I think typical like what we're experiencing, I don't remember it being cold or hot. Believe it or not, I can remember suits I wore every day, as bizarre as that sounds, um, but I do, because that was always a big thing. I gotta put another suit on, you know? Um, never knowing when I was gonna have to do an interview with the media or whichever, but, you know, so like that thing. And so it's not odd that it took us so many days to smell it. Because again, you're talking about a multi-million dollar ventilation system because of, and the other part of that was the mice smell. So uh, when I tell you I walked down there for the first time and I, I was taken back because thousands, to me they seem like thousands, I couldn't have told you, I didn't count. But you know, the smell of, of thousands of mice in all these research rooms in cages, they smell. So that smell was very overpowering. So much so when you left, you smelled of cages or, or whatever, whatever it was used for them. So I think that was part of the issue too, is that the smell was maybe getting morphed by the animals, okay. the, the mice. They were mice, they weren't, um, that were down there. So thank you. Any other question? Yes? Those cadaver dogs, were they yours from the Dominican Police Department? No, we don't have them. They were actually the Connecticut State Police. And that was a whole other, you know, because you have multi-million dollar research being there that are funded from corporations and agencies and the bringing dogs, animals into a sterile environment and whatever type of insect or whatever the dog may have on it. I mean, these were all things that we had to maneuver and go through kind of the red tape where we're like, yeah, cause this is at the, at the time we were in control of the investigation. I'm like, I don't care about your research. You know what I mean? Um, and, and for those of you that know me, that's the way I'm like, I don't care. You know, oh well. Um, you know, the dogs have to come in because we got to find her. And, and so they, they did their job. But it was the Connecticut State Police that came in with their dogs. Okay. Um, so September 13th, 2009, uh, Annie's removed. She's brought up um, to the medical examiner's office in Farmington where an autopsy is performed. Her, obviously, her um, manner of death is ruled as a homicide. Her cause of death was strangulation. Um, Annie had a broken jaw and a broken collarbone and had bruising to the uh, back of her head, consistent with, obviously, um, being assaulted at some point. Um, we start looking at key card access. All right, I remember I mentioned to you about the key card, and we know when Andy checked in, we start looking at everybody else that checked into Annie's lab room after, because that's the last place we know she was based upon key card. We see that Ray Clark used his key card to access Annie's lab at 1040. 
It's 29 minutes after she originally went in. Now, not typically, you know, there were other people that had entered into her room then, but we knew that we already interviewed them. People that had been there, they said, yeah, she was in there working. So we knew at 10, 11 to say 10, 20 ish, she was alive based upon other people. Ray goes in there at 1040 and then he goes in there again at 1104. So we're able, based upon that, to say sometime between 1040 and 1104, Annie's probably killed. Ray doesn't access any other rooms down there for 46 minutes. So something is going on in that room at the time. Now, what I can tell you, the room itself, um, door automatically closes. There's cages all lined up. There's a metal chair rail on the back. A very sterile environment. There is a little window that you can see into the lab, but you can't, there's cages, rows and rows and rows of cages. Where we believe Annie uh, was assaulted and murdered was in the back of the room based upon evidence that we recovered back there. Um, and, you know, after that, the key card and Ray's key card became paramount in this case where we were seeing what he did over three days and how he keeps accessing certain rooms frantically like 50 times in a day which he never had done all the months prior to this incident so what do we do we find evidence in that room you know this is stuff that we start putting together now this is after Annie has been found when Annie was found in the wall uh, there was a green pen and, and I bring up the green pen here there was a green pen that was found in the wall with her. We didn't know the significance of it. Was it her pen? Was it not her pen? You know, what is it? What, did our suspect have it? What is it? So as the Connecticut State Police are going through everything, um, there was like a log that um, the techs had to sign as to when they did certain things in certain rooms. Well, wouldn't you know, prior to 1040, Ray Clark used a green pen. After 1040, Ray Clark used a black or blue pen. No more green pen. We find Ray Clark's and Annie's DNA on the green pen that was in the wall. That was one of the items that, that tied it in. But it was, well, why, you know, this whole green pen became a big issue for us to help again link uh, Ray to this case. Multiple, multiple, multiple search and seizure warrants are prepared. Uh, they're executed on a lot of different things, but we, uh, in fact, issue a search and seizure warrant for Ray Clark to collect samples from him under court order. Uh, hair samples to be removed from his head, his arm, his chest, uh, buckle swabs, oral swabs, and also to have blood removed for him, and as well as fingerprints because what we needed to do was take known samples from Ray and compare them to the unknown evidence that we recovered from the scene. Everything's unknown. We had Annie's DNA, but we didn't have this other person's DNA that kept coming up in things that we were finding. Uh, we also had done search and seizure warrants on Ray's house, on a car that was in Ray's driveway, as well as the car that was used to transport Ray home that day, um, looking for evidence. Results started coming in in this case, saying Ray Clark, Annie Lay, Ray Clark, Annie Lay. That's who the DNA is on a lot of items we found, um, some of which I'm not going to go into. But the pen was one, obviously, that was, that was a big part, as well as other items of evidence. Uh, Connecticut State Police are still processing the same. So, you know, this was a long process. It, it's a massive uh, research facility and evidence was hidden everywhere and drop ceilings and, and bins down down drains in the research rooms you name it and he concealed evidence absolutely everywhere uh, and it was our job Connecticut State Police's job to find it so Ray Clark who is he he was an individual who had no prior criminal history who had worked at the Yale lab for quite some time there were no reported incidents 
There was nothing that we can prove between Ray and Annie. There was no, she never reported that there were, um, that they weren't getting along, that there were any problems. There was no text messages. There was no emails. There was nothing between the two of them other than he was a technician that worked in her research room. On September 17th, this is an actual uh, photo that was used. Ray Clark uh, was arrested at his, um, it ended up, well, this isn't the arrest photo. This is actually the photo that was taken um, when we had done a search warrant for him. But he was arrested uh, on September 17th for murder um, of Annie Lay. On March 17th, 2011, liter to the day, 18 months to the day, uh, Ray Clark pled guilty to murder and attempted sexual assault. It was the first time that publicly um, we had released that there was an attempted sexual assault that had taken place with Annie based upon evidence that we had found uh, at the scene. Originally, Ray was charged with murder and felony murder. He faced up to 120 years of incarceration for the charges. Um, he pled guilty to everything, was remorseful uh, of 120 years. The plea, which was accepted by Annie's family, he's going to serve 44 years uh, for the murder, 20 years for the sexual assault, but the 20 years are going to run concurrently at the same time as the murder for the attempted sexual assault. And Clark will be incarcerated into 2053. Why? Everybody always asks. I've done uh, a couple TV shows on this case. Um, you know, everybody wants to know the million dollar question is the why. We don't know. We really don't know why Ray did it. We have our, our guesses um, as to why he never told us why. He was interviewed early on by the FBI. He was given a polygraph early on by the FBI. Um, I'm not sure of what the results of that polygraph are now, um, but you can't use polygraph results anyway um, in any type of proceeding. And then Ray had stated he wasn't going to talk to us anymore and had retained an attorney. So we were never able to ask the why. Um, you know, we think possibly there was, he was infatuated with her, she was brilliant, they had worked together for a bit, she was due to get married. To us, that was the only thing that kind of made sense. Uh, there was a lot of rage um, in her murder and, and kind of the things that had happened and then the care and, and what he did afterwards in regards to the scene and the cleanup and the hiding of evidence and, and literally putting evidence all over the place and attempts to conceal who did it. Um, that's the only thing that made sense to us. But sometimes, you know, it, it's not logical as to why somebody does something. So, you know, I'm always asked, well, why do you think, why do you think, why do you think? It's hard to say. I mean, that's the only thing we can surmise because it makes sense as to the timing of it. You know, we know that Annie goes missing on Tuesday, Thursday she's due to go away um, to get ready for her wedding. And so here basically was two days before she was to go. But there was no evidence that linked us to that. Again, no text messages, no anything between the two of them that were found. Questions? Yes. Was there a psychiatric None that were known or, or documented, no. Good. Yes. Are there any attempts still being made to communicate with him that maybe answered the question once? No, from a law enforcement standpoint, and I'm not so sure his attorneys would allow it. Um, because it comes down to is, is the why would be self-satisfying. It, it doesn't change any of the horrific, truly horrific things that took place. And I don't, personally, I don't care what his excuse is for the why. It still doesn't, and it is, it's just an excuse. You know, he snapped. Um, there were reports that came out afterwards. It was all over Good Morning America and some other shows that ex-girlfriends came forward to say that he was violent in their relationship and he had a short fuse and all this other stuff. But there was no reported incidents of that. So you have to be careful with that kind of information. Um, everybody that worked with him, uh, the other research assistants, you know, or the researchers, nobody had anything bad to say about him. 
He kind of kept himself. He really cared about caring for the animals, and and and, and nothing made sense. You know what I mean? Um, I think for all of us, it, it doesn't matter as to the why, other than for curiosity's sake. I remember the page that I was local. Yeah, every yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And somebody else had their hand raised. No. Yes. Um, earlier, you said. Uh, his clothes were changed when he headed out to his vehicle mm -hmm. on that first day. His, his scrubs were changed, yep. The um, clothes that he was wearing when he had first entered work, did that turn up as any significant evidence? No, because what happens is um, when we did the search warrant of his house and we looked for those items of evidence, they were there, but they had been washed because the search warrant on his residence was done after, was done uh, almost a week later, <coughs> yes. You know, pre-plan is tough because we don't know. We that the only way to prove whether or not somebody pre-plans something is obviously if there's documentation, there's correspondence, or if they tell you, yeah, I've been fantasizing about doing this. Um, he he never said that. Um, you know, he had scratches on his body, uh, and that's one thing I didn't put in there. He had scratches on his body that, uh, when asked and interviewed from the FBI, he said they were caused from his cat. Um, but they weren't consistent with cat scratches. You know, am I a cat scratch ex expert? No. Yeah. But we all know what those look like. Those are little fine lines, jagged. These were not that. Yeah. These looked like, you know, scratches from fingernails or even from something trying to, you know. But he was, he was, he was an interesting person when I saw and, and heard the interview with him that was taken early on before we got involved. He, he was, but no, vo voluntary manslaughter was ne or involuntary manslaughter was never part of the equation um, based upon everything. The uh, injuries that she sustained, you know, even you can't claim that you didn't mean to kill somebody in a situation like that, you know what I mean? And, and, and there was no, his attempts to, to cover everything up afterwards and all of that. Okay. But good question. Any other? Yes. Was there any evidence that he was maybe under something for Um, Nothing that was reported, nothing that was documented, and definitely um, no claim was made to that. I think that if that was an issue, that would have been something that came up during the court proceedings as to trying to say he was under the influence, he was, un, you know, he had a, a psychotic break, but there was no defense ever given. Uh, he, in fact, actually pled guilty without anything. Initially, it was, it was not guilty, but a year and a half later, he actually pled guilty as we were getting ready to go to trial. Good, yes. So what about that experiment in that lab that was funded nationally? I mean, was that, did that all have to be scrapped? No idea. You know, I, and that's a great question. Um, from a law enforcement perspective, that was not even a concern of mine. And again, it comes back to like about the dogs. They're like, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, I can do that. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, the crime scene takes precedence and, and everything in it takes precedence over everything else. Um, part of me thinks it got scrapped, but I'm not 100% sure on that with the NSF, yeah. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, earlier you said that like there was uh, evidence basically everywhere. There was like multiple like rooms and things. Like mm -hmm. How many rooms were there? How long did they process all that? So the Connecticut State Police, I think, were there nine days, give or take, pretty much around the clock with two different teams of detectives. Um, there were several rooms down there. Um, I'm going to say, I'm just trying to go by room numbers that uh, probably seven to eight rooms, not including drop sailings, loading docks. I want to bring up the fire alarm for a second because remember I said I'd come back to that. So during this whole thing, there was a fire alarm that went off and everybody had to get vacated. And we're, from an investigative standpoint, we're like, this has to be connected. Somehow the timing of this firearm is connected to this case. And we were, ugh, 
we were like, there's no way it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, there was actually a, um, an autoclave steam type of uh, system that actually mal malfunctioned and caused the fire alarm to go off. And so it had nothing to do with this. The two people that were involved when that autoclave um, system went off were extensively interviewed. Their backgrounds were checked because we're like, they have something to do with it. Um, and they didn't, obviously. But you got to, you know, literally when I tell you everybody was a suspect initially, you know, once we started to say, okay, she's not a missing person, who else had access? And then we start looking at everybody that had access to her lab room. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.